Hi everyone. In this video, I will be demonstrating how to generate Cronbox Alpha and a bootstrap estimate for Cronbox Alpha using Stata. And the the uh, data that we're going to be working from, our example data, you can obtain by following the link that's provided underneath the video description. So in our data set, we've got uh, uh, several variables here, and the main ones that we're going to be using are these right here. And it, you can kind of imagine that these are reflecting items associated with a scale that's designed to measure some construct, uh, such as self-esteem or uh, intrinsic motivation or you know anything of that nature. So those items are uh, written up to reflect the construct definition uh, for what it, for whatever it is that we're trying to measure, and so the question is, is that assuming that we that the items are reflecting that uh, definition, how consistently are they measuring uh, that construct? So this is where the issue of internal consistency comes into play. Uh, so when we calculate measures such as Cronbach's alpha or perhaps you know McDonald's omega or, or measures like that, what we're trying to do is to evaluate the consistency of measurement of the construct that we are attempting to measure. So that's the basic idea behind internal consistency. So what we're going to do now is we will go ahead and generate Cronbach's alpha through a couple of means or a couple of ways. One approach is through the menu system in Stata. The other approach is uh, we can use uh, syntax. And then following that, I'll show you how to open up a do file and run a program that's designed to uh, generate a bootstrap confidence interval for our Cronbox Alpha. So we'll go ahead and get started by clicking on statistics. We'll go down to uh, where it says multivariate. Let me see if I can find that. There it is. And we'll scroll down to Cronbox Alpha. So we'll click on that button and we will select our variables, uh, which are basically those variables reflecting the items associated with our measure. So I'll click on X1, X2, X3, X4, and X5 right there. Under options, we have uh, several. Uh, the first one right up here is delete cases with missing values. So by default, what's going to happen is that if there's uh, if you have a case that has missing values on any of the of our variables that we're analyzing, uh, what will happen is is that the covariance matrix or correlation matrix that's constructed in order to generate our our coefficient alphas. Uh, they're going to be reflecting the use of pairwise deletion. And if we want to use um, listwise deletion in our in our estimates and basically uh, generate a, a correlation or covariance matrix uh, uh, using listwise deletion, then we select this option. Next, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, select list individual inter item correlations and covariances. Following that, we'll click on display item tests and item rest correlations. So item test correlations are the correlations between each individual item and all of the items associated with our uh, scale. Item rest correlation is the correlation between each item and the remaining items associated with our scale. So just think about it as item uh, test as reflecting the correlation between an item and the entire composite measure uh, of our construct, including the, uh, the item that we are uh, relating to that composite measure. And then item rest is really the, com the relationship between a given item and a composite measure formed from the remaining items associated with our scale. Then down below, you'll see that we have this option for standardized items uh, in the scale with a mean of zero and a variance of one. And, um, you know, really, you only want to do this or select this if when you are um, when you are uh, uh, creating a composite score uh, using, you know, maybe averaging or summing the individual items that those items are standardized. So in other words, the, the assumption uh, would be that uh, the items have a mean of zero and a variance of one. If you're not gonna do that, if you're not creating items with a mean of zero and a variance of one, and then summing or averaging them into a composite measure, then what that means is that you're using the original items with their associated means and variances. And so uh, in that particular case, you wouldn't want to interpret alpha using this option right here. So I'm going to deselect that because under most circumstances, folks don't uh, standardize their items before uh, averaging or summing them up into a composite uh, index. So now we will, we will go ahead and click on OK and generate our output. So looking at our output, you'll notice that we have 
um, right here. This is the uh, Cronbach's alpha for this full scale. And the theoretical range for internal consistency is going to be from zero to one. And the basic idea behind it is that, um, you know, the closer you are to one, the greater the consistency in your measurement. Uh, if you go back and kind of revisit classical test theory, uh, we could kind of denote reliability kind of with a uh, row, uh, you know, uh, X right here, uh, set that equal to, and we'll just say uh, that is a ratio of true score variance to the true score variance plus uh, measurement error variance, uh, if you will. So in other words, it's kind of true score variance to the total variance associated with your, um, your measure. And so, uh, the closer to one, the better. Okay, so um, because uh, what that's going to reflect is that we are, um, you know, uh, that um, more of the variation uh, in your scale is is uh, reflecting true score variation. So that would be kind of the idea behind that. So uh, at any rate, looking at our Cronbox alpha here, you can see that we have 0 0.9075, which is really reflecting a good, a good level of internal consistency, um, actually a, a quite good level. So if you want to think in terms of, you know, what would constitute sort of a lower bound for good, kind of in air quotes right there, um, a you know, a fairly conventional uh, threshold would be, you know, 0.7 zero or greater. So I'll, I'll just say, you know, 0 0.70 or greater uh, would reflect uh, good internal consistency. And then obviously, as you move into, uh, you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 or above, uh, then you're talking about much uh, greater levels of internal consistency. Uh, but again, 0 0.70 is a fairly conventional sort of lower bound. But um, obviously, you know, th there are various rules of thumb out there in terms of what constitutes adequate or good internal consistency, but I'm just, this is just one value that is fairly common. So now what we'll, what we will do is we will look at the next, uh, or in this column right here, we've got these alpha values. So these are basically uh, 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 computed coefficient alphas uh, should we remove a given item from the entire scale. So for instance, if I removed item uh, X1 right here, then I would expect coefficient alpha to to uh, drop to 0.8662. So with the item, alpha is 0 0.9075. But if I took that item out, then it would be 0 0.8662. So certainly the internal consistency of our scale would appear to suffer uh, as a result of removing that particular item. Uh, you can also see that uh, for X4 right here, if I remove that item, uh, the uh, Cronbach's alpha would be 0 0.9052. So you can see that there's not a whole lot of difference uh, between the, uh, the scale uh, that contains X4 and wh what what the scale would, uh, how the scale would perform if we removed it. The Cronbach's alpha, uh, the internal consistency estimate is about the same. Then you'll notice that we've got uh, over here, we've got our item test correlations. So those, again, are the correlations between each item and the uh, full composite measure. And then we've got item rest correlations uh, between each item and uh, a composite of the remaining items associated with the measure. So you can see that you know these values right here, these are all um, uh, nice large values over here. These values are also large, but you can see that they're a little bit lower than the item test correlation because these don't actually, uh, in terms of the composite, it's not including the individual item that's being related to the scale. And so that's why these correlations right here are going to be larger than these correlations right here. So there you go. Then if you look down below, you've got um, this uh, uh, covariance matrix uh, right here. So these are the inner item co covariances among all of our variables. Now, uh, if we look at the syntax uh, or look at our output up here, this is the syntax that was generated through the menu system. So you don't have to use the menu system. You could actually just type the syntax in directly. Uh, once, you, once you've once kind of memorized the syntax or learned the syntax, then it's just very easy to use it uh, down in the command line. So I'll type in, for instance, I'll type in alpha x1 uh, space x2 space x3. Uh, X4 and X5, comma, and then case-wise, and I'll type in detail and then item right here. 
So the structure, and by the way, if I just if I press enter, you can see uh, right there we get the same uh, output as what we had above. Now the structure is is the same structure as you're used, hopefully used to, um, in terms of syntax when you're running analyses through uh, Stata. You've got the command right here. You've got the variable names listed. Then you've got a comma, and then options that are given on the right side of that comma. So that's the general structure for uh, you know. Um, many of the analyses that are carried out using Stata. So at this point, we'll sort of transition into uh, creating a program in order to generate bootstrap uh, confidence intervals for our, uh, our uh, coefficient alphas. So I'll, I'll, to do this, I'm going to click on New Do File Editor. So when I do this now, uh, this editor opens up. I'm going to kind of add a couple of spaces here and, and, and increase the, the size, the uh, font size, so you can see it. I'm going to use the uh, zoom option right here. I'll just zoom in and uh, do this a few times right here just to kind of increase it so you can read as I'm uh, talking through. So I can also run my analysis of uh, the uh, the previous analysis through this do file. I can just type in alpha x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, comma, case wise. Uh, then I can type in uh, the um, items and details uh, right here. I believe that was, uh, no, was, there's no S on the end of that. So there you go. So if I highlight this and run it, uh, you can see that uh, I ended up inadvertently uh, adding an S to the items uh, that uh, as well. So there was a little error there. So let's try this again. And so I'll highlight all of this and uh, execute. And so there you go. So you can see that we can run the same analysis through the command line and through our do file. But that's not really the most interesting thing. Um, but that's just kind of a, a little detail right there as we are learning about how to use the do file. So next up, I'll I can also generate the standardized estimate from this uh, from our do file as well. I'll just uh, type in the same things. X five comma case wise item and detail right here, and I'll use the the uh, option STD right there. So that's going to get me the standardized alpha, alpha. So I'll go ahead and click on execute selection. And so now you can see that uh, right up here, it says test scale uh, equals mean standardized uh, items right there. So now we've got the standardized alpha 0.9189, which is different from what we had before, which is 0.9075. You also see that in the output, instead of having the covariance matrix uh, based on the um, uh, the, the variables um, original scaling, now we've got the inter item correlations among our uh, variables. So next, what we will do is we're going to write a program in order to generate our confidence intervals. So now what I'm what I'll uh, type in is the program uh, command, and then I'll type in the name of my program. So I have to give it a name. I'm going to call it uh, Kronbach right there. Following that, I'll type a comma, and then I'm going to type our class. Okay, so then I'll go down a few uh, uh, rows in here, and I'll type end. So we're going to type the program in between uh, the program uh, command and end down here at the bottom. So that's where we're going to type everything in. Uh, so what we will do at this point is we're going to have we're going to rerun our analysis. We're going to specify the the analysis that we had laid out above uh, in this little section. So I'm going to type in alpha and then uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. I could have just copied that. That would have been fine. But at this point, uh, that's what we're going to do. This is going to uh, generate our unstandardized uh, estimate. And um, next, what we will do is uh, we're going to type in on the next line. We'll type in return scalar. And then we have to basically we're going to create an object that's going to contain the reliability coefficient associated with each bootstrap sample. So for this, I'm just going to go ahead and type in U underscore uh, and then uh, I'll type in alpha. This is the name I'm giving it. There's nothing special about it. The return scaler, I have to type that in, but the name is up to you about how you want to do it. So I will type in U underscore alpha equals, and then R, and inside the, the uh, parenthesis, we'll type in alpha. So you may be wondering where this is coming from right here. Well, if I go up here to 
uh, where I had run the analysis before. If I type in, uh, if I type in uh, return list right here, and I highlight all of this and, and run it, you'll see that uh, when I run the analysis, that there is a, a list of scalars, which are basically single numbers, and matrices right here. So what we want to do is we want to take uh, the uh, the alpha value. We're basically we're basically taking this value right here uh, out out of this table uh, when we are running our program. So we're essentially running the analysis. We're extracting that value out of the table um, for each bootstrap sample. So you'll see right here you've got this R class object. It says R alpha and it's got equals 0 0.907479 and so forth. That's the same value as this right here. And so what we want to do though is to extract this information right here. And so that's where when we um when we uh, set this up, that's why we have return scalar and then underscore alpha right here. That's the name uh that we're using for our uh, scalar and then we've got uh, our alpha so that we're we're pulling this value or extracting this value uh, for use during our bootstrapping. So that's how we would do that. Then I'll type in, um, if I want the uh, standardized uh, uh, confidence interval for the standardized estimate, uh, again, I can type in alpha, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Obviously, you can copy and paste this. It's not, uh, I'm just kind of doing this uh, because it's still fairly quick. So in this case right here, I've got the comma followed by STD to uh, signify that we are generating standardized um, coefficient alphas. So then I'll type in return scalar again, and then I'll give it a new name. So for this one, I'll type in S underscore alpha to signify that I'm talking about a standardized uh, alpha. I'll set that equal to, to R and inside the parenthesis alpha as well. So just to show you this, I'll go back up here outside of the program and I'll type in return list right here. So if I run this and execute the selection, you can see here's our alpha uh, that's showing up in our, uh, our standardized alpha. And then if we scroll down, you can see under scalars, when we uh, 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 typed in return list, you can see we've got the R alpha is equal to 0.9189, same value that's showing up in this table up here. So that's how to think about it. So at this point, our program is essentially, uh, you know, at this point is saying that um, we're going to be extracting the uh, R class object alpha associated with each of those two analyses. So this is an the first analysis. This is the second one involving uh, the option uh, for the standardized alpha right there. So now what we need to do is to uh, specify that we're going to be performing the bootstrapping. So essentially what's going to happen is, is that, uh, that we're going to be taking random samples out of our data set and computing the alphas associated with those. Um, and then from there, in a nutshell, what will happen is, is that we'll be compiling that information uh, to create those bootstrap confidence intervals. So I'll type in bootstrap right here. And then we'll, we'll uh, type in the names of the R class objects that uh, we are uh, generating with each bootstrap sample. So those, those are U underscore alpha and S underscore alpha. So I'll type in R and then inside the parenthesis, I'll type in U underscore alpha to refer to the unstandardized estimates. I'll type in R and inside the parenthesis S underscore alpha to refer to those standardized uh, Cronbox alpha values. Then we'll type in a comma, and then we have some uh, options. So the first option is reps, and inside the parenthesis there, we specify how many replications we want to carry out. So for the purpose of this demonstration only, I'm going to type in 20, and uh, and this is just to keep things really, really simple. Um, you know what happens is is that the bootstrapping process, uh, the resampling process, um, is is just going to uh, carry out twenty bootstrap samples right here. But ordinarily, you want a much larger number. You know, uh, maybe a thousand, two thousand, uh, five thousand, maybe even more. And so that takes a little while to go through that process. And so I'm just trying to kind of keep this short for this demonstration only. So 
this is uh, woefully insufficient for uh, most bootstrap applications, but this is just for the purpose of this demonstration here. Next, I'm going to type in seed, and inside the parenthesis, I'm going to set a seed number. Now, the basic idea is uh, by doing this, what what I want to be able to do in the future is I want to be able to come back to um, you know to this code, perhaps maybe I save this, and I want to come back and maybe rerun it again, and I want to get the same. Uh, uh, lower and upper bounds for my confidence intervals. If I don't set the seed, you know, create a seed number, then what will happen is, is that the random uh, generator associated with Stata, each time that there that the analysis is rerun, I can end up with confidence intervals that differ somewhat from each other in terms of the lower and the upper bound. And that's because uh, of the random number generator associated with that. So if I want to be able to replicate the exact uh, confidence intervals in the future, then I need to set, set a seed number. And so for this, I've set it at one, two, three, four, five. Then I've got a, a colon right here and then followed with the name of the program. The, na the program name, that I, the, the name of the program that I gave it is Cronbach. So I'm going to type in Cronbach down here. So if I stop there, the output is going to give me uh, my my estimates for alpha, uh, my uh, unstandardized and standardized estimates. It will also give me a confidence interval, but it's a normal theory-based confidence interval, and I'm not going to want to use that. Instead, I want to use um, either a percentile or bias-corrected confidence interval. So to, to obtain that, I'll type in ESTAT, and then I'll follow that up with boot, comma, and then from there, I'll type in BC and then space percentile. So BC is bias corrected, percentile is a percentile confidence interval. These are two uh, types of confidence intervals that can be used. I'm going to defer, I'm going to leave it to you to make the, the, the decision about which one you want to use, but um, we're going to get output associated with both of these. You'll also notice that or one other thing I want to highlight too, up here at the top, I'm going to also add the following code, uh, which is capture uh, program. Uh, then I'll type in the uh, uh, drop and then Kronbach right here. And this is just a, a little bit of a safeguard to make sure um, that everything runs smoothly. But the main program is this right here. So, but we're going to highlight all of this and click on the uh, execute selection button. So when I press that, uh, you'll see that uh, some there was an error somewhere in my syntax. And uh, I found it uh, actually pretty easily. Uh, I forgot to add a little R there for to denote that this is an R class object. So uh, I had it up here, but I didn't have it here. And so that's why it didn't run. So let's try this again. Hopefully now it will all uh, work out fine. So now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and click on execute selection. And so you can see it's run. So I'll scroll up here. You'll see that we've got, it says bootstrap replications 20. So what will happen is, is that if you have a lot larger number of bootstrap replications, it's going to, it'll kind of slowly just kind of the dots will appear across uh, lines. And so then it, it just takes a little bit longer for things to be carried out. You'll see in terms of the bootstrap results, uh, we, we've got the um, right here for the first estimate, uh, this uh, underscore BS underscore one, that's referring to my unstandardized uh, Cronbox alpha. And then we've got the uh, this one right here referring to the standardized. So those are the uh, just kind of generic names or labels associated with uh, those uh, two uh, estimates. So there's the observed uh, Cronbox alphas for uh, unstandardized and standardized respectively. If we scroll down, you, you can see the code for that, uh, the remaining portion. So um, yeah, there you go. So now you've got, once again, the estimates themselves, as well as 95% confidence intervals that have been created. Uh, the P's are referring to the percentile based method. Uh, the BC is referring to bias corrected methods. So you see that we've got our 95% confidence interval for the unstandardized uh, Cronbox alpha. And uh, using the percentile method, this is for the uh, bias corrected method right here. Uh, then we've got, uh, you know, basically the percentile method and uh, bias corrected method right there. It turns out that we have uh, basically the same values um, for percentile bias corrected in this particular uh, demonstration. Uh, for those two confidence intervals.
Uh, one other thing I want to mention is, is that, um, you know, if you happen to have missing data associated with uh, in, in your data set and you want to, um, you know, kind of use that list wise uh, deletion approach during the bootstrapping, what you're going to need to do is to uh, exclude those cases uh, on your own and then to rerun the bootstrap. So that's what their this little warning message is right up here. So that's just uh, something to kind of keep in mind um, as you're as you're running your analyses. So that's going to pretty much wrap up this video presentation and I appreciate you watching.